exciting stuff. Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. Let's start with the usual boring logistics slide, blah, 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 yada, yada. Um, you know, they're mostly here so that you can just have some filler to suck up extra space because you probably download these. Anybody download the slides? Look at them online. You waste the bandwidth instead of wasting the bits on your storage device. Makes perfect sense to me. Um, storage is so cheap, of course, I don't pay anything extra for storing them on my website. I give them, I don't know, like, like $300 every three years or something. Nothing's changed here. Uh, nothing must, nothing really changed here. On Thursday, you have a self-assessment activity. Your design project three implementation code uh, needs to be submitted. Just to be clear, um, it has to compile. That's going to be the bar. That could have been the bar all along. Um, people actually submitted like code for completely different projects, and I was like, no, that's, I mean, I'm trying to make this pretty low effort, but the code we give you compiles. So if you submit the code that we give you, it's not that hard. And I know a couple of people struggled with the fact that there's a shell script that builds a zip file for you to submit. Um, some people dragged and dropped directories in there. It's kind of brutal. The, the reason that it was done that way is because the DS Labs is uh, running inside of a containerized environment, and if we let you load any code that you want in there, it is possible, not realistic, but it is possible for you to compromise the system. Realistically, you're not going to do that. It's Java code. It, it literally unpacks the files in one directory and copies only the files it needs over into another directory, but people are paranoid about this stuff. And I have seen systems where you can crack the container. Next week, there is no class on Tuesday. So no class, no lecture. Uh, accordingly, I actually moved the weekly capstone report to Thursday from Tuesday because you're on a break. Um, that, I'm sure that means all of you will be sleeping or doing other things, probably actually working on stuff. But that's, that's your choice. So um, it'll go back to Tuesday the week after that. Don't forget the capstone project team declaration is due on Thursday. The, I, I went and looked, and all of the teams I had created were filled up, so I created more Greek letter teams. When that's done, I will actually manually create teams so that Canvas will count them and use them correctly. I will manually create the teams um, after that Thursday at 5 p.m. Uh, deadline. If you are not in a team, then you will be put into a team of one. Everybody will be in a team. It will be anywhere from one person to five. Adding there. Ah, new slide. So the resolution to the final exam problem is that the final exam will be offered to you in two different formats on two different dates. One of them will be, uh, I think it's December 7th. Is the last day of it's the Thursday, um, which is the last day of class. It will be in class. And it will be um, probably 70 to 75 minutes, roughly. It will be 10, I'm sorry, 20 multiple choice questions and 20 true false questions. And they will be of the style that I've been using for the self assessment. I will publish the final exam that I used last term. And it won't be the final exam that anyone actually got. It will be the final exam with all of the questions on it. Because um, last term, I provided everyone with their own personal individualized exam, like pulling from question banks and randomizing the order of the questions. So you could sit right next to somebody, look over at their, what they were studying, and go, what did you do? Because the test was completely different. And what was sort of cool about that is then when you turned in your exam, I gave you the, uh, the version of your exam, your personal exam, with the answers on. That was, that was fun. I don't think I'm going to do that this time. I'm not sure yet. We'll see how much time there is. Both exams will be design-focused. 
the, uh, the in class one because we have less time to do it. Um, the designs will be, you'll be given these choices, true, false, um, yes, no. And the, the goal of those is to make sure that you at least slopped up a little bit of design thought, but also that you absorbed at least a few of the concepts and ideas from distributed systems. Uh, the final last term was actually pretty tough. I don't think that anybody scored more than about 80 or 85% on it. Um, you know, it's, it's easy. There was, they had 50 questions. And it's easy to screw up a couple of questions and boom, before you know it, you got, you know, 85% of the questions right, but you got 15% um, wrong kind of thing. So no one question is going to be super heavyweight, but it'll add up. The final on the 22nd of December will also be design focused, but it will actually be a design. So you will be presented with four different possible de design scenarios, and you will choose one, and then you will work out in, in the final um, your approach to it. Identify the problem, explain how you, how you designed it, what your solution would be, why you chose the things that you chose. It's basically like you sat down and did one of the design projects or your capstone project. So um, I will be publishing design scenarios for you to consider. I will not use any of those design scenarios without modifying them somewhat for uh, the final exam. That is the final that will be presented on December 22nd at 7 p.m. in God knows what forsaken classroom they managed to find. Hopefully the door will be unlocked. Um, I wouldn't get it, put it past them to accidentally put us in a room where the door is locked. You do not have to take both. You have the option of taking either one, none, or both. Um, the final grade will be the maximum of this is the number seventh one. You do not have to take this. Technically, it's against the rules to require you to take an exam, but I can do an optional one with permission from the relevant authorities, and they have given me the nod on this. So some people were concerned because they had travel plans. They're welcome to come and take this exam and skip the one on the 22nd. Some of you might be really concerned about making sure that you manage to get, I don't know, a 96 instead of a 94, in which case then you can, you can maximize your score by taking both of the exams, and um, you'll get the max of, of the two. Twenty percent. So it's twenty percent for the exam, twenty-five percent for the capstone, and fifty-five percent for the various activities, the self-assessment, design projects. Yes, that's correct. That was the design from the very beginning, and I said that the very first day. I said there's going to be a whole bunch of things that all you have to do is just do them, and you won't have to worry about passing the course, which takes some pressure off of you. On the flip side. I don't want to make it super easy for anybody to get 100. I mean, if you want to hit it out of the ballpark and get 100, and it makes you feel better about yourself, great, go for it. In the end, what I'm mostly interested in is seeing that you have learned about distributed systems and that you have gained some appreciation for why design is important when you're trying to build a skyscraper, aka a distributed system. I think the analogy I used the other day was it's like, you know, you can go and build, um, you can go build a doghouse by getting some materials and you know, randomly hacking things together and the dog will go happily sleep in it. But you don't build skyscrapers that way. You spend a lot of time up front designing them. And then you go and implement them. You had a question. Will you know the result of this? That is my goal. So... I mean, sorry, this one is optional. That's correct. The other one is, well, they're, okay, they're both optional, right? In that if you don't go to either one of them, you do not need to take the final to pass this class. This is a fourth year class. I'm not going to be 
beat you into taking a final if you if you get to that point where you go, hey, I got 20% on my cap, you know, 20, 20 points out of my capstone out of 25, right? And I got my 54 because I missed one thing. So I got a 74. I'm good with that. And you don't want to take the final, go for it. Put your time and energy into some other class where you're more concerned about it. That is your choice. You are adults. You are finishing up your final year of university. Some of you are finishing up your second time of final year of university. There's some BCS students. And you get to choose where to spend your time. I'm not going to make that choice for you. Yeah. You don't have to attend the 22nd anyway. You don't, I mean, literally, you could just simply say, and I had people who did not take the final. And one of them, I said, if you take the final, you will pass this class. And they didn't take the final. That is the only person who didn't pass the class last term. And people were scared, really scared, going all the way into the final that they were going to fail that class. I mean, I did kind of adjust things appropriately. This time, I took a different approach. Um, several people have asked for concessions on dates and whatnot, and I haven't given them, because there's no single thing that you had to do that was particularly impactful. Right, lots of little things. Well, it'll be, you know, so given this situation, which of these tools would you use? Or which, of approach, which approach is the best or the optimal? Um, I, I've been trying to, as the, the term has gone on, I've been trying to move the, the self-assessment questions towards more of that model where they are, they're, they're giving you a situation and saying, what's the best solution to this particular problem? And that's because that requires additional understanding. Some of that is, I'm getting better at formulating those questions. And some of that is, it's easier for me to ask them now that we've been talking about these things for weeks and months. Months, right? Early September to early, early November, two months. I mean, I've actually had people tell me that they can explain Paxos to, to others, kind of scary. Yes. No, it's just, it, it, it will give you design scenarios, and they will either be true or false or multiple choice. The, the, the 22nd will only be one design question. It will be a bigger design question, but it will expect you have the same kind of understanding. It's just that um, since I expect that a number of people won't take it, I can actually open it up a little bit because I have to grade those because there's no one who's going to grade them. Literally, the department shuts down at 5 o'clock on that Friday and isn't open until 2024. And so I can't even take those exams and have them scan them. So I will have to take them home and I will have to put them through my scanner. Thank God I have a nice two-sided sheet scanner. And I will upload them into Gradescope, which is what I did last term. And then I will actually spend my Christmas holiday grading them so that I can get those grades submitted before my appointment, which expires on December 31st, goes away. And I'm sure the university being very efficient about these things, it will turn off all my access to everything. So, you, know, you guys will take those, those uh, qual, qual metrics thingies. They'll ask you about, you know, how bad does this guy suck? I won't even get to see them. I had to walk into somebody's office in the department who pulled them up, and I could see them on their laptop screen. Well, you should be able to see them. I'm like, you guys removed all my access. But, you know. I also do, uh, last term I did this as well, um, I opened up a, a brutal honesty thread. And I might open it up a little bit early this term because most people didn't actually post anything. But I turned on full anonymity on Piazza and I said, let loose. And it was kind of tepid. I mean, the, 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 the scorchers had come earlier. The person who said, you talk about file systems too much. And you see how I responded to that, right? I said, fine, I'll talk about databases too. See, sometimes you just have to look at the feedback and really action it. It may not be what they wanted. I think it worked out, though. Pretty happy with the way this has gone. Um, I like today's lecture because 
it feeds into a lot of what we've talked about, and I, I didn't talk about this at all last term, and I'm really happy that I'm talking about it this term because I think this is really important in understanding distributed systems, the whole idea of anti-entropy. Today's failure, uh, somebody posted a, a, a dissing of Cloudflare, and so I picked one of their failures and said, well, let's go look at this failure. And so it wasn't a super long failure, it was 93 minutes. Although I think that the actual post that someone put on um, Discord was, well, gee, I've had two 12-hour plus outages on Cloudflare this month. Um, yeah, things go wrong. This one was sort of cute because it actually involved a key value store. Yes, this is perfect. Workers, Workers KV is our globally distributed key value store. Um, Unfortunately, it started returning an unauthorized access. Ever had that happen? I've gone to websites that do that. They're like, you go through the whole authentication process, and then it says, sorry, you can't look at that page. WTF is wrong with you. I mean, do you ever swear at web pages? I feel like I swear at them all the time. It's just so bad. Um, and there's a link the actual discussion, the write-up on this, October 30th, 2023. So what was that? Eight days ago, nine days ago, nine days ago, right? Um, stuff keeps happening. There was a really cool one that came across my feed, I think, yesterday or today, and I, I, um, I saved it away because it was just yet another cool failure. These things happen in distributed systems all the time. We have to keep that in mind. We have to think about how things are going to fail. I think the one I posted on Discord because it was, um, it was a data center in the tropics and the cooling system failed. <laughs> oh, yeah, not good. Not good at all. So we're going to talk about Petrov, Chapter 12, which is about anti-entropy, propagation of data. So we talked a lot about consensus protocols. We talked about how we linearize the operations. And then it's somewhere along the way, we said, but wait a minute. We agreed on the order that things happened in, but don't we still have to apply it to the database? And so one way we can do that is we can keep the database and the acceptors co-located. Co and the learners and all, you know, so the learners the learners run on top of the database the acceptors can run anywhere and the proposers can run anywhere and so if you put a proposer acceptor and learner all together in one node you actually have a strong consistency model because as soon as it's decided and you learn about it you apply it to the database but we only needed a quorum okay well i have 737 nodes And that means that I only have, I don't know, 736 divided by 2 plus 1, whatever that is. I don't care. But there's still like 300 and some odd of these nodes that may not be up to date. How do I get them up to date? PMMC actually solves this problem. PMMC actually forces reads to serialize against the, uh, the log. So that the answer you give back, once you've serialized everything that was outstanding when the read came in from the client, will have at least been a possible answer. Might not be, well, and actually in that case, it was the most up-to-date answer at the time I received the request, which is what's kind of weird about it when you think about it. What? So I'm giving you yesterday's answer because now I know that was really yesterday's answer. And yes, that is one way of doing it. So they have a serialization model. We had some discussion about using quorum reads to make sure that we are giving an up-to-date value. Uh, last lecture, we were talking about versioning. We talked about um, several different techniques. The problem in all of these cases is that because we've made a linearization decision, that is independent of the database, there can be a time lag between when we've decided what happened and the order it happened in, and when we've applied that log to our replicated state machine, aka our key value store. I spent some time talking about eventual consistency. Well, eventual consistency sounds lovely. Absolutely excellent. But eventual consistency is not 
a strong, safe system. If I want to give you a strong, safe system, I still have to guarantee that I'm giving you a state that could have actually existed. I love that. That's a definite maybe, isn't it? Could have actually existed, yes. I'm giving you an answer that you could have received back. Because if you cared about something stronger than that, you built a transactional system on top of my key value store. Because transactional systems give us the strongest of guarantees. Why don't we just always use transactional systems then? How many nodes were there in my hypothetical system? 767? How long is it going to take for you to get 766 of your friends to agree on where to go for dinner? Yeah, you'll starve to death before that decision is made, right? So that's the point. There's a scaling issue here. We probably won't have a lot of situations where we have 767 copies of the same thing. But I don't think it's too hard to imagine having 101. It worked for Dalmatians. It'll work for key value stores. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Communications, propagation of data, cluster-wide metadata, scalability, anti-entropy. Um, what does it mean? What is entropy in this distributed systems model? And what is the difference between doing something in the background and something in the foreground? And I got lots of very surrealistic pictures that you don't want to read the text on. It was very cool. I saw this thing about ChatGPT's big, OpenAI did a big release of features yesterday. And I watched a, a YouTube video of somebody, and the, he was using the, the updated Dolly interface. Um, and he was looking at the images it generated, and it was like he was going and counting the number of fingers on people's hands and making sure that ears were there and whatnot. It's like looking for the details. Kind of cool. I was like, so it's not just my imagination. It generates very interesting, surreal pictures, but they're not always very real. Um, apparently, they're getting better. So, in a distributed system, entropy is a measure of how much our copies, our replicas, diverge. If I want zero divergence, I'm going to use transactions. I'm going to require that everyone agree that we can move forward. What is the problem with insisting on everyone agreeing before we can move forward? It sucks. It's super slow. As I was pointing out earlier, imagine that I just simply throw why language matters. I throw my lunar data center into the mix, and suddenly all of your operations uh, take two seconds to resolve because we have to get the Lunar Data Center to agree to this as well. So obviously, that's easy for us to reason about and laugh and go, oh, of course we're not going to do that. That's not tenable. No one's going to play my game if I have to synchronize everything with the Lunar Data Center. How many of you play games? How many of you would be willing to tolerate a two-second lag for everything? You're like, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Right. I mean, when your ping goes below 100 milliseconds, you're probably sitting there going, ah, this is really sucky. What you want is 10 seconds. That's when the sweet spot, that's definitely it. I live in the gaming data center. It's two racks over. <laughs> Maybe that's the job you get after you finish. I don't know. So entropy is just a measure of how much things diverged. We want to minimize this entropy because as much as we like eventual consistency, we still want it to be pretty close. Boy, that's a hand wavy definition, isn't it? Pretty close. So we create mechanisms that actually reduce entropy. Anti-entropy mechanisms. Boy, that's deep, isn't it? There are a couple of different communications uh, propagation models that we use. Uh, there is a, an interesting issue of peer-to-peer -peer versus multicast. Now, in fact, I think Petrov uses broadcast, but I'm using the more general term 
multicast. Multicast is one to many, and that can include one to everyone else. The problem with broadcast is it doesn't scale. If everybody's broadcasting to everybody else, then what happens is that all the bandwidth ends up being absorbed by these broadcast messages back and forth. So we end up looking for ways that we can minimize that as much as possible. And we end up using some combination of multicast and unicast. We can do it hierarchically. Maybe we have, uh, there was this idea in Paxos of having distinguished learners. And so the decision went to a distinguished learner and then it per percolated out from the distinguished learner to the individual learners. Well, that is nothing more than an anti-entropy mechanism. Lamport didn't call it that, but that's what he was basically saying. He said, oh well, yeah, okay, we decided on what happened. Now we have to tell everybody. The Lunar Data Center is not gonna learn about it in less than a second, no matter what we do. So in that system, we know that our minimum entropy there is going to be a second. And that means there are going to be things that happen in that second that the Lunar Data Center is not going to know about. And we're going to have to think about how we do that, how we use that correctly. I like the Lunar Data Center model because it's a large enough time frame that our brains can easily look at it and go, yeah, two seconds is way too long to be waiting for this stuff to happen. In data centers, even the propagation delay between locations, between different data centers, can become a serious issue. Um, there was a conversation I had with somebody in the class about the cost of moving data. Let's suppose that you were working for a company that had Let's, let's choose some small number. Let's say you had um, 400 petabytes of data, and you want to move that into uh, AWS. How would you do that? How long is it going to take? So in fact, the way that Amazon does it is they send you a disk. Sometimes they send you a van full of disks. It used to be they would send you a semi-trailer full of storage devices, and you would pump all of the data into the storage devices, and then they would take that van, uh, cube, semi-trailer, and they would move it to an Amazon data center, and they would then pump it out of the disks into the data center itself. Even today, the data centers move large volumes of data using trucks. The bandwidth of a truck full of storage is still orders of magnitude higher than the bandwidth of the entire internet. And you don't get to use the bandwidth of the entire internet to move data. So literally, data movement is a huge, huge issue. And this is just one aspect of that. If I'm spending all of my bandwidth shouting at everybody else, telling them about what I'm doing, I don't even have time to move the data. So it's going to take you years. And no one's going to wait years for the data to get moved. Bad enough that you, you, know, you back up the, the semi-truck and you spend a week, a week doing a, a, a backup of your data, and then three days for it to get there, because, of course, they don't let truck drivers sleep. They just keep driving. And then it gets to Amazon, and they spend a week pumping it into their systems. And now you have to do an incremental backup because your data changed in the meantime. It's still faster. You still have done this in less time than you would have if you tried to do it over a network. So moving data is very expensive. Sending messages becomes very expensive. And we don't want to do amplification. We don't want to send way too much data. This is a huge problem in systems in general, and it includes distributed systems. And that is what's called um, IO amplification.
we talked about uh, log structuring storage. And in log structuring storage, you end up doing extra I.O. because you have to garbage collect your storage. I think we talked about that early on. It turns out that if you don't do this very well, you can see a 100x increase in your I.O. I've been there. I've done it myself. Oh, look, I have a half a gigabyte of space and 90 gigabytes of data, and I need to change the encryption key that's being used on this file. Well, it turns out you can do that, but you will end up doing, I think it is at least 100x I.O. safely. You prove that you can, and then you realize you didn't really want to in the first place. So picking the right paradigm for communication, for moving the data, is in fact a function of what your model is. How much data do I have to move? What am I trying to accomplish? What is a reasonable balance between anti-entropy and no bandwidth left? Because if you just do this very naively, you will very easily exhaust your bandwidth capacity. You'll flood your switches with small packets or big packets or medium-sized packets, and they won't be able to do anything. Your network will melt down. And then you'll have other classes of failures, right? Because now your packets will be dropped, and they'll get reordered, and at least Paxos will work eventually. Broadcast is not efficient at scale. So what we end up doing is we move. I did like this picture. I thought it was one of the better pictures I got. Um, uh, but we, we move from a centralized model where we're sending it out to a more decentralized model. So we still have some centralization, but it's much smaller. And it then sends out to other locations. And then they transfer it down. So this is, this is Paxos all over again with Lamport and his distinguished learner kind of model. So it's nothing super exciting. Another problem with using a single, uh, a single location to send out updates, to send out information, is that, of course, it can fail. We know how complicated it becomes to recover from the failure of a leader in Paxos. And this problem amplifies when you are using a lot of messages. When you're sending a tremendous number of messages there, getting a new leader up, Moving everything over takes actual time. So how do we mitigate against that risk? Well, we distribute out our points. Maybe it's not a complete mesh network, because that's the full broadcast model. Maybe it's not the single point of the universe that controls everything else. Maybe it's something in between. And that's usually what we end up settling on. But the specific details of this are going to depend upon what you are building. Some things are more important to get propagated than others. So for example, you might have configuration data. And configuration data, you want to have propagated fairly quickly because it controls how all of the rest of our information is being sent. So you can have tiers or importances, priorities of traffic. Anti-entropy is key to implementing eventually consistent systems. Eventual consistency is awesome. It says, hey, we're going to reach a decision on this. We don't have to reach the decision yet. We just know eventually we're going to reach a decision. And if you recall, we used specific kinds of data structures. Commutativity was a really big issue there, right? In, in a commutative system, the order in which operations get applied doesn't matter. And so that gives us a really nice, eventually consistent system. But of course, if, I, if, if I'm building a shopping cart, and my shopping cart says, how many of those do I have in stock? And it says six. If it's eventually consistent that it's two, it doesn't matter. The outcome for your shopping cart is exactly the same. Amazon literally did start with a shopping cart which took products out of inventory at the time you put them in your cart. They don't do that anymore. They haven't done that for a very long time because they found that it didn't matter and it was too expensive to maintain. They went to an eventually consistent system. What would happen then is that occasionally you would get to checkout and you would try to buy something and it was no longer in stock. 
because that was the point at which they took it out of inventory. And now they would say, we're sorry, that product is no longer available. They did conflict resolution. If conflicts are rare, that's exactly the right answer. That's exactly the right solution to this problem. Question. Conflict resolution is a mechanism by which you minimize entropy. It's just not what we think of. So, so if there's no conflict in, um, in a CRDT-based system, for example, if there's no conflict in a CRDT-based system, we apply the operations and then things are fine. We actually won't know, in a CRDT-based system, we won't know if there is a conflict for something like I just described unless we wait until we reach a consistency point. So when Amazon sells you the product, and realistically, they don't even do this, but when Amazon sells you the product, they take it out of in inventory, but maybe they get to the, the warehouse and they find out that it's not there. Because these are physical products and sometimes things disappear. Uh, they get destroyed, they, they get count miscounted, and so, I've had cases where Amazon says, oh yeah, this is going to ship tomorrow, and then two months later they ship it. So it's clear that they aren't super concerned about consistency anymore. They have a relaxed consistency model. If you cared more about that, um, I don't know who it was, but I, I loved the, the person who said that they went, had an interview for a financial institution who asked about uh, signing their database, and they said they recommended eventual consistency. Because, you know, that's what you want for your ATMs. Oh yeah, well, eventually that money will come out of your account. It's all good. Yeah. So the choice is very much model dependent. Um, conflict resolution is a reasonable approach for some scenarios, but it's not a reasonable approach in others. The conflict resolution in Amazon's shopping cart case is, hey, sorry, that product is now out of stock and you're going to have to wait. And if you change your mind, you can cancel it. Amazon will let you do that. Cancel the order. And if it takes too long, you can cancel it and send it back. And so they've dealt with this in a different way. But it means that when you're sitting there buying things, by golly, you can just click, 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 and you're done. So the common case, make sure that Amazon maximizes the likelihood that your cash will transfer from your bank account into theirs quickly and efficiently. Even if the product trickles behind slowly back to you. They don't actually charge you until you get that right, but you get the idea. Eventual consistency is great for performance, but it does create a situation where we have divergent state. So anti-entropy helps things along. It says, yes, we know in the fullness of time this will become consistent, but I really like to get it there sooner rather than later. How do I do that? Well, let's see. One way of doing this is we can actually have these background processes that, that run and look and say, what's changed? And there are these funky data structures called Mer Merkle trees. And Merkle trees are really great for keeping track of what's changed. This is what Git uses. This is what blockchain uses, which is Thursday's lecture. Um, if you're, any, anybody here trade cryptocurrency? I heard a new term yesterday called pig butcher. Um, and if you don't know what a pig butcher is, it turns out there are these people in, I think they said it was um, in Myanmar, that run social media scams where they try to convince people to give them money. And a lot of time that money gets funneled through uh, cryptocurrency because it's, a, it's a, a nice way of laundering money. It's, it's you know, the modern equivalent of buying Apple gift cards and sending them to people on, online. I, I, maybe you guys have never had anybody try to get you. It turns out there are people who actually do this for a living. Um, Chinese government recently helped break some very large ring because a lot of the, a lot of the people who are getting drafted into this 
is basically an enslavement technique for uh, Chinese uh, migrants in, and then they they make them do this stuff. And it's like, wow, this really makes me want to trade cryptocurrency, doesn't it? Yeah, I want to help these people. Add it. There you go. That was a nice distraction. Now we'll get back to Merkle trees. They're not just for creating fraud. They're also for tracking differences, for detecting what has changed in an efficient fashion. In a background processing model, what happens is there's something that's reading the nodes. And you can look at the Merkle trees, and you can exchange information about your Merkle trees, and you can figure out what has changed and bring them into sync with each other. When you do a, a git push, that's what's happening. It's synchronizing your changes with the changes in GitHub or GitLab or, or Bitbucket or whatever you use. Uh, GitHub.cs.ubc.ca. Foreground processing means that we actually perform anti-entropy operations as part of our normal I.O. So for example, we might do a quorum read. And when we do a quorum read, what we will end up finding is it will read some nodes that are behind. They have an older version of the data, for example. Perfect. I will push an update to the nodes that are behind. And that becomes part of the foreground process. Because I did a quorum read to get a consistent snapshot of the data. And then I can tell the people who are behind Oh, by the way, your database is behind. You probably want to have this change applied. Yes. Could you undo write operations that haven't completed? I hope not. A few nodes that are, OK, so, so one of the questions becomes, right, how do I determine when it's up to date? Now, the nice thing about Paxos is if any learner, any learner learns a value, you know it was decided. So if we have some sort of a clock value, some sort of a number that says this is the newest value, I could read six, 16 nodes, and 15 of them have an old value. One of them has a new value. I know that new value is correct. So that's a nice thing about Paxos. It gives us very strong safety guarantees. Though. And so we could actually implement it that way. Yes. I may not know. Maybe you're not using version numbers, in which case then you, you do a quorum read, and you take the, the most commonly occurring value. And now you, have a, you, you know that that commonly occurring value is the most up-to-date value, because it happened in a quorum. Yes, these are both techniques that we would use. Quorum reads are expensive, though, right? Because I have my, what was it, 767 node system. That means I have to read 767 uh, divide by 2, round it up. That's a lot of reads to do. And that doesn't guarantee that I have enough, does it? Good. I read that many. I have to get half plus 1 know what the value is. you have a question? Um, the, the Merkle trees are used in background processing. So it's, there's literally just a little background process that, that pulls the Merkle trees from nodes and compares them. <coughs> no, they're already computed. Yeah, normally, the Merkle trees are computed on the nodes themselves. So you just exchange Merkle trees. And then you know what's missing. No, I don't believe that Merkle trees require that you recreate everything. Uh, the structure, I'm not an expert on Merkle trees. But the structure of a Merkle tree, as I recall, is that you don't invalidate the entire Merkle tree. If you make changes. You only invalidate the portion where the changes are located. Yes, because it's a tree. It's an actual tree of these things. Um, as I was going through this, I'm going, I really probably should go read up on Merkle trees again. It's been a while. It's one of those data structures that if I need it, I just go ask at GPT. I go look it up on the internet and read a nice article about Merkle trees, because there are plenty of things about Merkle trees. 
Did you have a question? Oh, okay, I thought. I'm seeing. It happens when you get old. So read repairs are a very common approach to fixing entropy. Kind of cool, isn't it? I'm going to read this data. I'm going to notice that some people have old copies, some people have new copies, and I'm going to fix the ones that have old copies. And that way, they catch up. So again, entropy is a measure of system state divergence. And how much entropy I'm willing to tolerate is defined by how much inconsistency I'm willing to accept. I don't want to ever see any entropy in my financial databases. They should be exactly the same. The whole point of, of Paxos was to give us a mechanism for providing that kind of very strong consistency. But Paxos doesn't solve the data propagation problem. It solves the linearization problem. We still have to solve that data propagation problem. And if you think about it, this is, I, this is part of what helped me think, uh, reason about this. Remember in Paxos, when we have leadership changes, there are situations where the leader isn't necessarily up to date. So before the new leader can propose any new things, any, you can't make any new proposals until it knows that it's up to date. In other words, its entropy has to go to zero. Cool. OK. That makes sense to me now. I like this, you know, it's just sort of random entropy, more or less. It has nothing whatsoever to do with anything here. It's just a pretty picture, and I don't like text on slides. So the consequences of entropy are that you can actually have data conflicts. You can have dif disagreement between the copies, the replicas of the database, as to what is the current value. One of them is more recent than the other, I hope, ignoring Byzantine-style failures. Well, gee, I wrote it on the disk, and I read it back, and it came back completely different. That can't possibly happen, right? Sorry, I have bad news for you. Turns out the disks lie all the time. There are known bit error rates on disks where they will actually return data that is not what was written there. Just a fact of life. So, we can, so ignoring those problems, we can still get data conflicts because we have different versions. The Lunar Data Center is the second behind the, the um, uh, Heron Data Center. Think of what the right term there was. Heron Data Center is more up to date than the Lunar Data Center, so we can easily have a data conflict there. Oh, gee, for some reason, your computer decided to download it from the moon instead of from um, uh, what is it, US West 1, a AWS. You can read old data. Uh, you can lose your sense of trust in the integrity of your data itself. That, so the interesting thing here is that applications can break sometimes because these sorts of errors creep in, and they're not prepared to handle them. They wanted the cheapest possible data service they could get. They bought the eventually consistent data service, but they just assume they're always getting the most recent copy. Application programmers will do these kinds of things. Companies will do these kinds of things. Companies are routinely doing these kinds of things, as you will find out when you work for companies. They will cheap out on the stupidest of things. We will pay a software engineer $100,000, but we will buy them the cheapest laptop we can find. The fact that, you know, productivity suffers because they're constantly waiting for everything, eh, well, but that came out of somebody else's budget. It's, I, I see some nods there, but I've seen it in real life. I've seen companies that will hire more people but not buy them equipment because equipment is a capital expenditure, and people are uh, out of payroll, completely separate line items on a budget. Eventually, if it doesn't happen to you, you'll know somebody. They will get hired into a job, and it'll take like two weeks to get a computer for them. And they'll just be sitting there, okay, what am I supposed to do? Well, here's your paycheck. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, not that bad. As, 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 but it, it could be as high as about 10%. But usually, it will be much lower than that. Like in file system, generally under 1%. Depends, right? If I give you tons and tons of little tiny files, your metadata percentage will go way up. Um, it's always interesting to me that when you do studies of file sizes on, on just like your you know, laptop kind of thing, almost all your files are small. Like almost all of them are less than 4K. So one of the things that consistently turns out to be beneficial, and I've done it, uh, pretty much all the file systems do it. If the file's small enough, they will actually store the data of the file inside of where the metadata region is. It's called an inline file. And I read the metadata, I get the data out for free because I pick a fixed sized unit for my metadata storage. When it overflows out, then I have to do fancy things by putting secondary data structures and whatnot. But that only applies to the big files. The little files, just store it right in the, in the um, iNode. And now I did one I.O. to get the inode, and I happen to have the data. Um, at one point, NTFS did 4K for their equivalent of an inode. And then they decreased it to 1K in Windows 2000. Didn't really make much difference, but it meant that in 4K, like 80 or 90% of the files were inline. And when it goes to 1K, it's only like 40% of the files are inline. Pretty, pretty interesting. So yes, we do a lot of things to minimize the impact of that metadata. But there is metadata. And how much metadata there is will depend entirely upon what the goals were when you were designing that database. I mean, I'm, my research is about indexing things. And it's all existing things. So everything I do is all overhead. It's all metadata. And my target is to be less than 10%. And that's one of these like, long-term sorts of things. You can sell pretty much any systems audience on, well, it didn't take, it took less than 10% overhead. And actually, I, I've sold this to people before. It's like, well, how much, space, you know, how much is this going to take? And I said, well, we're not exactly sure, but it'll be under 10%. OK, that's fair. Because of course, in exchange, what happens is suddenly you can find things you know, like that paper that you wrote two years ago that you now needed to find, or the code for your 416 project, which you're going to be looking for in five years, going, that was such a cool project. I have to find that code. But I don't remember where I stored it. So we use synchronization protocols. We use versioning. We use conflict resolution. All these are examples of how we manage our entropy. How do we try to get caught up? This is a lot. This isn't a very large chapter in Petrov, right? And I'm rambling on and on about it. But it's an interesting piece because it's the piece that we have to deal with after we get Paxos in our heads. Paxos doesn't solve this problem, but it is a real problem. Like I was saying before, I didn't teach this at all last term. And I was really glad when I'm putting this together, I'm going, this is really cool. Because I, one of the things I thought was missing last term was this conversation about, about recovery, about getting the data caught up. Because this is the whole point of our distributed system. And we have gotten sloppy. We've said, hey, performance is more important than correctness. But it's only a little more important. And so between consistency and availability, we are trying to figure out where that perfect balance is. And the reason that there are good job, op job opportunities in distributed systems is because there's no correct answer. And no matter what you do when you build these systems, there will be people who want something different. And then they're going to want a tuning knob. I want strong consistency. I want weak consistency. And you have to try and make all of these things work together. How many of you have actually looked at any of the distributed databases, the distributed systems? If you have, you'll notice they actually usually have a knob that says what level of consistency you want. 
Do you want fast? Do you want safe? When we're trying to decide what our propagation method is, we're, we're going to be making a series of trade-offs. You were talking about one of those trade-offs, which is how much resource, additional resource are we using? So we start computing Merkle trees on things. We start adding versioning to things. I mean, what am I going to do? Am I going to add a 256-byte version vector on every 32-byte data object? Maybe that's a little too much overhead. Maybe I need to use smaller versioning, or I need to use larger data objects. And so you end up balancing these things back and forth. How fast does this need to converge? The faster you need it to converge, the more overhead there ends up being, because the more aggressive you are about getting those updates propagated. None of this is free. Computing Merkle trees isn't free. It requires CPU. Of course, you may not believe this, but it turns out that most of the CPU cycles on your machines these days are never used. They are there busy running the idle loop. I remember years ago seeing one of these marketing presentations where they were showing you know, how they'd improved the performance. And one of the things they had improved was they had decreased the amount of time the idle loop was running. I don't think you guys understand what's going on. It was a marketing slide, totally marketing slide. And as a technical person, you look at marketing slides and you go, these are completely detached from reality, aren't they? You will see that. The more nodes there are in the system, the more complex scalable strategies become. I mean, if I've got three nodes, keeping them in sync is not a big deal. If I have 767, I think that's the number I keep using. If I have 767, it's a lot more work to keep these things in sync without dragging the performance of the system down. Fredo was telling me that um, he's been on the interview circuit and he was talking to some people at TU Munich, TU München, and he said they had a class there, systems class, that was 2,000 students. I was like, okay. Georgia Tech only had classes of 1,000. 1,000 sounds like a really big number. Like, can you imagine being one of 2,000 students? The largest class I had as an undergraduate was 60 students. And the smallest class I had was three. Speaking of Germans, it's a German prof, that class. It was combinatorics. Everyone should take a class in combinatorics. OK, so when we're trying to build reliable systems, we want to eliminate any single node dependencies. We end up using things like cooperative broadcasts so that a failure of, of one node can be uh, other nodes can step in. Gossip protocols are very common here. What is BitTorrent? It's a very resilient kind of system for propagating data. If you think about it, they're, they're always pulling data from each other, and it, it works. It is very efficient. So we know that you can build these kinds of very scalable systems. But I don't know if anybody here has ever looked at BitTorrent, but it's a little complicated. And it's doing it with static data. It's not dynamically changing data. That's not your key value stories that we're talking about here. Your databases that are not only have large amounts of static information, but then have new information constantly being added and some of the existing information being modified. A foreground processing, the benefit of foreground processing is it means that we're doing it very quickly, because people are churning this. If somebody's reading this, we're making sure it's up to date. Kind of interesting. If somebody's not reading it, well, we're not going to pay as much attention about it. And it's like, that's exactly the right way you want to do it, right? You want to keep the things consistent that people are reading when the stuff that nobody's reading, eh, let it lag. So that feels like a good trade-off. But it slows the current operations down a little bit. Maybe not a lot. Maybe that's acceptable. This is a really good thing to do for critical read-write operations. So maybe what we're going to end up with, and most likely, we're going to end up with some mixture of foreground and background. Block-structured merge trees are kind of like that, right? Is that we end up 
migrating cold data from, from what were previous, from what was a previously the hot area to the warm area, or the warm area to the cold area. And that makes sense, because you can do that in the background when your machines are idle. Machines and data centers actually do have periods of, of idleness. Um, you know, like when the sun is mostly over the Pacific Ocean, there's just not that many people in that strip. But you spread, some, you spread some of the workload out. You do this when the data center has a lull, and the data center people know when they're at, what their activity levels are, and they can predict them pretty well. So they can, they can schedule these background processes. Background processes running lead to eventual consistency, and they do it in a way that doesn't really impact the performance of the foreground. So again, this is a balance. You can see why there's no one solution here. Lots of trade-offs. And you could spend two years implementing one system that only explores a little tiny space in that trade-off re region and realize that you could spend the rest of your life doing completely different implementations with different sets of trade-offs and still not explore the space. Job security. You have to deal with failures. This is particularly important in anti-entropy because the failures are the very time when things get, that we increase entropy. When we have a partition in the network, we're not updating all of the nodes, and the nodes that are falling behind are falling further and further and further behind because they're not part of the current quorum. We can actually have nodes go away permanently. How do you deal with that? That, that ends up being like a configuration change. That node is never coming back. Well, we're very sorry, but that particular data center melted down. I wish I could say yeah, I was making that up, but I'm not making that up. The, the, the graphic for the, the, um, the one in the tropics was really cool because it was literally a data center with the flames coming out of the computers. And you can just see that. Yes, data centers have and are destroyed on a regular basis. I'm not saying every day, but I would be surprised if you went and started looking and found out that Amazon doesn't lose a data center a year, maybe more frequently. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hurricanes, earthquakes, fires, floods, you name it. Those things happen, and they deal with it. The recovery strategy that you use will depend upon the type of failure. When you actually have a full meltdown in a data center, let's suppose your data center disappears because the earth opens up and swallows the entire thing, and you build a new data center. You're not going to move the data through the network. You're going to move the data through an 18-wheeler truck full of storage devices. You literally will use what's the upscale version of sneaker net what they call it, when you put your data on a disk and you carried it from one place to another. I've shipped USB sticks around. I've shipped whole hard drives around. The fastest way to move data. Latency sucks. You don't want to game over it. But for bandwidth, it's still like, it's two or three orders of magnitude. I think it was Dijkstra, and he's been dead for a while. I think it's Dijkstra who actually said that uh, nothing beats the bandwidth of a van full of hard drives. And despite the fact that he said that in the 1960s, which is like before the beginning of time, despite the fact he said that in the 1960s, it's still true today. So anti-entropy and recovery are about ensuring consistent data replication and getting the data disseminated across all the working nodes. That's what it boils down to. We made a decision on the order of operations. Now let's get the data into our key value stores so our databases are up to date. Strategies that we can use here include, um, and Petrov is talking about these things, pitted handoff, full state synchronization. The model I just described of where I back up a storage device and I put it all on storage and I ship it over, that's full state synchronization writ large. Maybe I don't need to do that because it's not really that much data. Maybe I can just push it over to the cloud and that's fine. A couple, couple hundred gigabytes, it'll be done in a day, half day, two hours. I mean, after all, you've got you know, gigabit networking at home, right? 
and it'll be a gigabit for a little while, and then they'll go, hey, sorry, fair use says that we're going to throttle you back. But they'll keep charging you for a gigabit. Which of these kinds of strategies will end up depending upon your specific use case? These are the kinds of things that I will want to ask in a design. Here's the use case. Here's the failure scenarios you have to protect against. What are the techniques you're going to use to protect yourself? Performance is always, always, and I love the trippy picture here. Um, performance is always important here because you can have the most amazing system, but if the performance sucks, nobody's going to use it. But it was beautifully architected and designed. It was brilliantly written in Rust. We have a complete model of making sure that we have strong safety guarantees. Ah, dude, but your key value store sucks. It's so slow. What's going to use it? Performance is always important. Anti-entropy can be expensive. And so this is, again, where we're going to end up with these trade-offs and going, oh, I, can't, I need to get it consistent, but nobody wants to pay the price. And you will eventually figure out that rather than build the system and then find out that it sucks, it's better to model the system, aka design, build a model, evaluate the model, and say the performance is not going to meet our requirements. Instead of spending $100 million to build something, you spent $5 million to build it and figure out it didn't work. I'm not really making those kinds of numbers up. I mean, I don't know if you've actually looked at the cost of building data centers, but the data centers are in the hundreds of millions kind of category. They're huge, and they're expensive to build. So when we schedule things, what we try to do is we try and fill in the idle times. You know, ah, you're gaming. We'll just have you work instead. You're running the idle loop. That's, that's the equivalent here. The disks are spun down. You're running the idle loop so on and so forth. There was a really cool project that Microsoft Research did um, a decade ago called Pelican, which was where they used hard drives. And they powered down the hard drives. And they found that they only needed to run about 8% of the hard drives at a time. Rotating hard drives generate a lot of heat. When you power down the hard drives, you save the power, you save the heat load, and that means you're not spending the cooling move the out of the data center. These kinds of things do make a difference. So you end up trying to balance the cost of anti-entropy versus the performance of the system itself. And you're never going to get it quite right. You're going to have to keep tweaking it back and forth. Again, job security, because there's no one right answer. Um, incremental synchronization is common because, of course, we don't... So like I said before, one of the nice things about foreground read, uh, read updates is that foreground read synchronization means that I'm only synchronizing the things that people are reading. If nobody's reading it, nobody really cares if it's out of date right now. So the entropy there, the effective entropy there, is very low. So I gave you this initial model of entropy. I said, well, you know, it's the, the variance between the systems. But then, ah, but if nobody's looking at the data, I don't care if it's out of date right now. I'd like it to get up to date eventually, but there's no reason to rush it along. You can prioritize your critical data. Finally, advanced techniques here include things like versioning. Now, a simple kind of versioning is you have a monotonically increasing sequence number. A complicated versioning number system, which is what you use like CRDTs and um, uh, almost any graph-based propagation system, is a vector. Because it's not just one version number, it's everybody who's touched its version number. And that allows us to, to perform certain kinds of reasoning about what has happened. When I take two values, there will be some difference in those version numbers, and I can actually figure out which one is newer than the other? I pulled some stuff out of a hat here. There's a little rabbit, big rabbit. Um, 
it's not guaranteed that all systems can be solved in this way, but in fact, the eventual consistency models I talked about before, for example, CRDTs, in fact do work with this kind of a model. Because they are using different implementations of the same underlying theory, namely lattice theory. Uh, this idea that you can have multiple paths through the system that end up in an eventually consistent state. Um, lattice theory is based on what are called um, partially ordered sets. Partially ordered sets are uh, these elements out of graph theory. And that's exactly what a vector gives you. It gives you an implementation of a partially ordered set. Assuming you put right. There are quorum recovery models. Those are expensive to implement, in, in all fairness, because you're now talking to lots of nodes. There are partial quorums where they don't actually go for a full quorum, they kind of, they, more like a sampling kind of quorum, where, well, I think I'm gonna get close. And when you include that with version numbering, for example, it means that you can see, relative to the things that you sampled, how close am I? That gets you closer, decreases your entropy. The factors here include what your data model looks like. How complicated is it? How reliable is your network? The more reliable your network is, the easier this stuff becomes. I got lots of bandwidth, I have really low latency, and my network never drops or reorders packets. Life is good. And then you have to come to reality, the one we live in, where, uh, sorry, but purchasing bought cheap, cheap, shitty switches that drop every third packet, um, the cleaning lady unplugs the router every Friday when she vacuums the, the uh, entry rug, and so on and so forth, right? That's the real world we live in. So the network isn't 100% reliable, the bandwidth is not infinitely uh, unlimited, and the latency is not zero. But by golly, you can design some really cool systems when your latency is zero, your bandwidth is infinite, and there's no packet loss. It's just not very realistic. Uh, of course, your consistency requirements for your databases are going to be a big deal here. Examples here include uh, DynamoDB, which is not the same as Dynamo. Amazon has two things, one called DynamoDB and the other one called Dynamo. Dynamo is a key value store. DynamoDB is actually a SQL, SQL data. I, apparently, there aren't enough names in the universe. They had to cycle Dynamo. And Cassandra, which is uh, an Apache open source uh, distributed database. These are both examples where they use advanced techniques as part of their anti entry as part of keeping their databases. There you go. It's actually not a very large chapter in Petrov. I've dived pretty deeply into this at this point, and if you go and read through it, uh, it'll fill in the cracks for you. This is what I consider to be the last of the heavy lectures now. The lectures that I'm going to do after this are going to be more topics of interest. They're, and part of this was deliberate. It was by design, right? What I needed to get stuffed into your heads at this point was the stuff we've been talking about because this is the stuff you needed to do uh, to know in order to be able to build any kind of reasonable capstone project. Next, next Thursday, I'm going to talk about um, we've already talked about Byzantine fault tolerance a little bit. I'm going to dive into uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance. I'm going to talk about blockchain. Those are interesting consensus protocols, interesting consensus algorithms. They're probably not something you had to know. Well, they're not something you had to know in order to build your capstone project. So I'm going to be toning these things down. The lectures are going to be more informational. Only like five to go. Uh, the lecture is going to be more informational, and part of that is because I want you to be spending more of your time working on, on your capstone project, which is now. So, also due on the 7th of December, although I think it's due at midnight. Sorry, 23.59. Bong, bing, bong. Anybody have any questions? Anybody even awake? You're all sitting there thinking, what's for dinner? Gonna, gonna pull out your app and order from, you know, what is your favorite ordering app? Sorry? Antoine. 
take forever. They do. They take like an hour and a half. I love watching them carry my food all over Metro Vancouver. I was like, I was hungry two hours ago. Then again, I've... I, yeah, none of them do a very good job of predicting how long it's going to take to get the food. They're also out of UBC. Well, if you're at UBC, then it's a crap shoot. Yes, you had a question besides... We're broken. Someone didn't test it very well. Okay. I think that somebody thought through a model of failure and missed modes of failure that actually could happen. This goes back to my usual example, which is anything that you can think up will go wrong in a distributed system will go wrong. And then the things that you didn't think up will go wrong as well. Um, we were talking before about where, when you switch from manual to automated. The danger with automated processes is that when they go wrong, they tend to melt down. because the, almost always a cascading failure of multiple pieces going wrong. On the flip side, when you do things manually, you screw up. Humans tend to make mistakes at a higher rate than automation does. So there's this weird balance between the two. Because when automation breaks, we pull humans in who are used to screwing up and can try to unscrew it fairly quickly. But the more automation there is, and the farther removed you are from that automation, the less people understand about what the automated system is doing in the first place. So for example, you're working at a company, you build this really nifty, cool automation tool, and then you transfer to a different group in the company, and then a couple of years later, your stock's vested, and you're like, I'm going to do the diversification thing, and I'm going to go down the street to some other company, and you're gone now. And now, some assumption that was in your code breaks. And he's now the one who was just hired last week to take over the role that you had two years ago. And he's like, oh, I have no idea. That's what really happens in the real world. So. I, when I read that, I just felt like they were kind of papering over things, to be honest. That, that oh, yeah, you know, uh, some configuration scripts that just didn't work the way they were anticipated, probably because the person who wrote them was gone. Um, it's really hard to pick someone else's code base up and do anything on it. But imagine that the only time you pick it up is in the middle of a fire, and you have to put the fire out. And you're like, I have no idea what this does, because no one looks at code that's working. Um, when I taught operating systems, I always, I had, I loved teaching people how to read assembly code well enough to figure out what something was doing, because I had this particular piece of assembly code. It was a, um, in Windows. There, there, it's literally, there's a device driver that will make the speaker go beep. It's called the beep driver, believe it or not. And what I loved about this was go and you look at this thing and you realize that it does things that have not been required for any version of the Intel CPU that Windows NT ever ran on, which is what we currently run. Never. And so I think somebody took that driver from Windows 3.1 or something, modified it to run inside of Windows NT, and it then got inherited over and over and over again into newer versions and it was in Windows XP, and so on and so forth, and do any of that stuff. And then the best part was, then I showed the 64-bit the version of it, and it did the same kind of stupid thing. It did it in a slightly different order, but I looked at it and I said, no one looks at that, no one's ever going to fix that, because it doesn't break. As long as the code doesn't break, no one will look at it. 
And that's what I think happened at Cloudflare. These things have been running for months or years. The person who knew what they were supposed to do was gone. And so some poor soul like you got hired on and you were like looking at it going, WTF, I have no idea. Well, it was a configuration script error. But how do they make, how do they maintain C compilers? Okay, so a compiler is mostly a front end engine that reduces the language into an abstract syntax tree, and that abstract syntax tree is then fed into a code generator that can take any abstract syntax tree, because they all conform to the same model, and generate output code. So what you end up seeing is that modern compilers are almost always built on top of some common engine, and we reduce the language down to that common engine. And so the, the bulk of the interesting work is done inside of the compiler core. The, the stuff that's on the top, parsing and, and, and lexicographical analysis and parsing, I walked into the lab today and somebody says, oh, we found a book that you wrote. And I'm like, uh, which one? Lex and Yak. And I'm like, yeah, that was like longer ago than I care to admit. Um, and it was just about the, the front end of the compiler, right? Where you, you actually tokenize the, the language and then the tokens are fed into a grammar um, that's auto-generated. So you write the grammar and then it auto-generates the code that interprets that grammar. And it was fun because you could build like little compilers and interpreters and stuff. Um, and those tools are still around, but when you go to a real compiler, what ends up happening is that the real compiler, they always reduce it down to some common core. And so most of the, most of the maintenance is actually, uh, most of the complex maintenance is actually inside of the code generation because that's what ends up being optimized for the particular platform. And it's, 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 it's modular. You have the language that sits on top, C, C++, uh, Rust, blah, blah, blah. You can sit there, because they're putting Rust on top of LLVM now. So the Rust language goes to an intermediate form. That intermediate form is understood by the LLVM, and then the LLVM has plugins on the bottom that generate the actual assembly code that you need to run on a particular processor. I mean, have you ever actually tried to debug a compiler bug? I have. It's hard. It's crazy. You literally sit there and look at this code and you say, this code is not doing what the original language code did. And it's very challenging to track them down. People love to blame the compiler. Oh, the compiler's broken. It's almost never the compiler. Almost never. The problem with that is it's the same thing. Because it's almost never the compiler. When it is the compiler, you look at everything else until finally you run out of things to look at and you go, hey, maybe it's the compiler. And then you get some very clever people who get in there and they rip the thing apart and they say, yeah, this assembly code doesn't match the, the original language. That's hard. And that is exactly what ends up happening is that you, at, at the, the further away you divorce things from the, the guts underneath, the harder it is to figure out why things break when it goes wrong. It's not like these distributed systems are complicated or anything, right? All right, we're way over time. Well, all right. Three minutes. We're three minutes over time. Thank you for staying, and I will see you on Thursday when we will talk about Byzantine fault tolerance and blockchain. And I'm just using my slides from last term, so I actually uh, get to relax a little bit. And you won't get any crappy pictures. Well, there are some crap. There are some illustrated pictures in there by a real human as opposed to a, a, a fake intelligence. You could say that about me too. So. All right, have a good night. Hey, Cortana? What? <laughs> That's funny.